Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here. Uh, welcome to Playload. This is all my video game pickups for the month of April 2014. And as always, we'll start off with some of the things you guys have already seen. Uh, now this, I got a 32X and I got a Game Gear. Uh, these were both sent to me for free by a guy named This I This. I did a video on it. Um, the majority of that video is really just the restoration of this 32X, but uh, yeah, there's really not much else to say. They're totally working and they look great now. And uh, thank you again to This I This for sending me these. Uh, I got a Super Famicom, uh, which is pretty sweet. Uh, this also I got from I got this from a friend of mine named uh, Daniel. He hooked me up with this through a trade we had done quite a while ago. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it looks pretty good. Uh, I did the de-yellowing. It's not perfect, but uh, yeah, no, it looks pretty great. Uh, through the camera, it looks a lot better than it actually does in person. But in person, it still looks pretty solid. Uh, but if you remember from that video, assuming you watched it, the whole lid was completely destroyed, and I actually had to have it replaced by a lid uh, a friend of mine in the UK named Raymond sent me, and uh, so I put that all together, and uh, there you go, we restored a Super Famicom. Now, uh, of course, to Americans, uh, my fellow North Americans, um, this is the Japanese equivalent of the Super Nintendo. Looks completely different than what we got. And uh, to, of course, Europeans, you guys recognize the body design, because this is what your Super Nintendo looked like, save for that being slightly different and saying Super Nintendo on it. Um, now, there's a lot of... This doesn't have a whole lot to do with the video, but I'm just going to address this story, because people always ask me, like, why did the American Super Nintendo not look like this? Uh, the official story is that, uh, you know, the NES was problematic, and um, Nintendo of America did some research and found that uh, a lot of Americans were putting beverages on top of the console, on the NES. And it would, you know, spill and damage the console, and that's why it would stop working. So they designed the SNES to be have like a boxy type of design, so that no place on it you could put a drink. Now, I think that story is bullshit. And I think that because, look, man, Americans, we do some stupid shit, but I don't think we're that dumb. <laughs> I think that the actual reasoning behind it uh, was just that the NES was a very poorly designed console. Uh, that front load design is just, it doesn't, it's not reliable. And Nintendo was looking for an excuse to say, like, hey, it wasn't our fault. Um, and the reason that, that I believe that that's the case is because when you look at Japan, their version of the NES was the Famicom, and it's a completely different design. It's a top loader, and, you know, it's very reliable. Now, the NES, as we know it, did come out in Europe, but was nowhere near as successful as the Sega Master System. So, in North America, where the NES just dominated, it makes sense that that's where the majority of the complaints of faulty units would come from. So I'm pretty sure that it was kind of a conspiracy, it's a conspiracy, basically, but conspiracy theory, since I have no proof, I guess I should say. Uh, but that's, that's my theory. I think that's the reason that this is not the body we got for North America on the SNES. It would just boil down to bureaucratic bullshit, but uh, again, just a theory. Now, moving on, I also got a GameCube. Now, I did a video on this very recently, which, if you guys saw that, holy shit, a GameCube is incredibly complicated to open up. Uh, this was sent to me by a guy named Chad. He hooked me up with, hooked this, he hooked me up with this, basically for free. Uh, I did send him a couple of data disks, but uh, really, uh, yeah, he, he basically gave this to me for free. Uh, now, I use this as my dominant GameCube, uh, and that's why I attached my Game Boy Player. The reason I do that is because this GameCube, is even though, even though I restored it, is really not in that great of shape compared to my other ones. And so I leave it out as the one I use because eh, if you have multiple consoles, it, in my opinion, what you should do is use the ones that look the worst. Uh, that way, if anything goes wrong with them, then you kind of don't care as much and keep like the nice, pristine ones away, assuming you have multiples of the same console. Now, this one's interesting, of course, because it's the Platinum version, and it has Component Out. Uh, component Out allows for um, 480p, um, uh, not HD, but enhanced definition signals through the GameCube, and most games support it, and they, they look very good. Uh, now, the thing that's interesting about that is that... Uh, Nintendo released a few different colors of the GameCube, black, purple, and you know, and then there's like those weirder variants that I don't know if necessarily count, but they also released this one. And by the time they released this one, they were pretty much done putting component ports on there. So what I'm basically saying is a platinum GameCube with the component port is relatively rare. 
not necessarily valuable, but uh, rare. Like if you go into a Goodwill and you see GameCubes for five, this one could probably, you know, get you, you could probably get it for 10. You know what I'm saying? It's it's a little bit more valuable, not but not a whole lot. Um, and also for the hell of it, Chad threw in a sealed VMU for the Dreamcast. Now I got a bunch of VMUs, but still, I'm not going to open it because that's just neat to have a sealed VMU. My guess is that this came from a, tar um, a Toys R Us. The thing about Toys R Us, and this is a theory again, much like that, um, Toys R Us, man, I know the ones that in my area anyway, they really supported the Dreamcast. Like, I don't re remember any other retailer giving as much space to the Dreamcast as Toys R Us did. And I remember Toys R Us, even when the Xbox 360 came out at launch, they still had a section for Dreamcast stuff. Now, granted, obviously none of it was, like, new stuff. They weren't getting new releases that no one else was. But it was just leftover stock they hadn't sold, and they just kept it there. Um, and eventually, I think when, you know, the PS3 and the Wii were about to come out, they kind of realized we need the shelf space, so they started closing out all their Dreamcast stuff for uber cheap. And I remember going in there and buying, like, six of these things for, like, 50 cents a piece. I mean... It was insane. I bought so much Dreamcast stuff at that point because, like, games, too. Like, they were just getting rid of them. So, not that I was... Again, that doesn't have a whole lot to do with anything, but I'm just guessing that this came from a Toys R Us because the, they seem to have a shitload of the blue ones. I used to see stacks of them there. So, yeah, blue VMUs in this box are very common and usually came from Toys R Us. Now, moving on... Uh, I picked up some Sega Saturn games. I'm still on my quest to complete a North American set. Not particularly close to that yet, but uh, I am working on it. Uh, this one's interesting, actually, Command & Conquer. Uh, it's interesting because this is now the second time I've bought something on eBay, and the seller sent me a message and said, Hey, dude, I watch your videos. So, assuming you watched this video as well, shout out to you, guy who sold me this thing. I'm sorry, I don't remember offhand. Um, Command & Conquer for the Sega Saturn. Uh, picked up a couple others in, through a couple of lots. Uh, this is Bust a Move 3. Uh, this is a cool puzzle game. This is uh, Bust a Move 2 is also on the Saturn, which I already have actually. And uh, Bust a Move 3 is the rarer one, so cool to pick that up. Uh, center ring boxing, nothing special, just part of the lot. The thing that's interesting about it is that it's another game that fucked up the Saturn logo. Uh, typically on the side, uh, you'll see the. Here, I'll compare them. Look at that. That's what it's supposed to look like. And this is what they fucked it up and reversed it. This happens in a couple of games. Uh, I, th I want to say Rayman also did that, but I, I don't remember offhand. But there's a few that seem to put the logo on upside down. And you can tell because that shiny part on the orb is supposed to be to the right of the, I guess, the S or whatever. And in this case, it's the bottom of it. They just flipped the logo. But yeah, center ring boxing. Woo! Uh, Croc, The Legend of Gobos. Uh, this is actually a pretty cool platformer for the Saturn. If you have a Saturn and you like platformers, probably one to pick up since there's not a whole lot of options on the Saturn uh, for platformers, and that's, yeah, it's not a bad one at all. Uh, FIFA 96 Soccer. Uh, you gotta get all the sports games. It's just, it's part of the rules if you're going for a complete set. And uh, fortunately, they're cheap, and they typically come in every single game lot. So, there you go. FIFA 96 Soccer. Skeleton Warriors. This game is actually pretty cool. Um, this game, it kind of looks the way the old Donkey Kong Country games did. You know, kind of that, like, claymation live look that they had. I don't know how else to describe that. But more advanced because it was the Sega Saturn. Now, it doesn't play anything like that. It plays a little bit more like Streets of Rage. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed this game. Here's a couple of screenshots. I don't know how well those are going to look. Yeah, you see that? Kind of looks like that claymation live action. Kind of like Killer Instinct, actually. Um... Yeah, so, uh, I played this for a bit, I thought this was pretty fun, and I just found out through, uh, Did You Know Gaming, that this was actually made by the people who ultimately went on to make Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, so, there you go, that's a neat little factoid. And finally for the Saturn, I got Guardian Heroes, now this is the, uh, gem of the month for Sega Saturn stuff, for sure. Uh, this is like a $90 game, but I did not pay anywhere near that, uh, because again, I bought stuff in lots. Now that's the way to do it if you're trying to hunt down certain games, because every once in a while you'll see a seller who has like, you know, three or four games or maybe even more, and doesn't want to take the time to find out what they're worth because they don't really care. It's just like, oh, this is my son's old video game shit, and just throws it all up there for some buy it now. So, got a good deal on the Saturn stuff, and I was happy about that. This game is pretty fun, actually. Uh, this is, again, it's another... 
kind of it's like a side-scrolling fighting game. I don't know really how else to put that. You know, at times it looks like it's just a conventional fighting game, and other times you're like walking along and beating stuff up. So it's it was pretty cool. It actually supported six players through um, multi taps, which is pretty neat. And uh, yeah, I would recommend this one if you have a Saturn. But again, it's it's kind of a costly game, so whatever. Be uh, I hope you get lucky. You know, like the way I did. And uh, it's a Sega Saturn exclusive. Uh, moving on. Goldeneye Rogue Agent for the original Xbox. Do you guys remember this one? No? Alright, well the deal was, after Goldeneye for the N64 was a huge hit, and they couldn't quite make Perfect Dark the same thing. Like, Perfect Dark was good, and they had the same guys working on it, but they didn't have the name, which is really what held Perfect Dark back a little bit. So they sold off the name eventually, and made this thing. Now I don't know if any of the original developers of Goldeneye worked on this or not, I don't think they did, but there might have been one or two, I, don't, I really don't know. But uh, this is interesting to me just because they went ahead and made a sequel to a game for a movie, and the movie never got a sequel directly. Um, yeah, this game's also on the PS2 and the GameCube, though of course I picked up the Xbox version because that's, as I said in some of my other videos, that's that's where I go for my multiplats in that generation just because they were typically the superior ports. And um, of course it's an original Xbox game. They're dirt cheap right now. If you're into the original Xbox, I'm telling you, there's no better time to strike, and there never will be. These, this was like a dollar at a thrift store. I mean, they, they are so cheap right now, original Xbox stuff. Whereas GameCube, not so much, and PS2 is starting to rise. So, yeah, if you like the original Xbox, or if you're even remotely interested, strike while you can. On for the Xbox 360, we got uh, LEGO Harry Potter 1 and 2. Uh, I really, I have not played these yet, but I really like the Lego games, like Lego Star Wars, Lego Indiana Jones, Lego Batman, etc. And so I'm confident that I'm going to like these a lot, because I like the movies, I like the story, and I like the gameplay from all the others, so I can't imagine this will actually be bad. So, <laughs> there you go. I look forward to getting around to those. Uh, this I, is one of the newer pickups, um, and what I mean by that is a game that just came out. Now, granted, Walking Dead has been around for a while, but uh, this is the Game of the Year edition. Now, Amazon actually just put this up for $20, and uh, it's cool because it's the full game plus all the DLC and stuff because it's the Game of the Year edition. And so I figured, what the hell, I'll go ahead and pick it up. And then, like, the day after I bought it, they're like, oh, yeah, Walking Dead's coming out for Xbox One and PS4. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> so probably shouldn't have done it. But, uh, yeah, wanted you guys to go ahead and see that. So, anyway, um, picked up some games that, uh, for a system, I almost never buy anything for. Uh, a while back, I bought an Atari 7800, and it came with Pole Position 2, which is the most common game on the console. And uh, recently, I was in a bookstore, and for some reason, they had some games for the Atari 7800. These were all, like, 99 cents a piece, so I was like... Fuck it, you know, I don't have any Atari 7800 games, so I'm going to go ahead and pick some up. Uh, this is Asteroids, I think most of us are familiar with Asteroids, probably a pretty good port of Asteroids, actually, but uh, whatever. Then we got, uh, well, I'll save that one for last, and we got Xevious, which is another all-time kind of famous game. And then we got Ball Blazer, which is funny to me because, well, it's a weird name, it's actually by Lucasfilm Games, before they were known as LucasArts. How interesting is that? His color artwork, which is obviously, as you can see, extremely rare on the 7800, and I just love that it says that. Super Game Cartridge. Like, what the hell does that actually mean? Super Game Cartridge. Like, as if, uh, opposed to a mediocre game cartridge? I mean, no, as opposed to a video game cartridge. Somehow that's better, because it's in color, and it's super. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, moving on, I got... Uh, for the N64, Kobe Bryant in NBA Courtside. Now, I actually don't give two craps about this game. Now, I love the NBA, but, um, yeah, no, I, I didn't pick this up because I wanted the game. Uh, if you guys remember a while back, I picked up uh, a Nintendo 64 DD, and I had um, picked up F-Zero, the Japanese copy for the N64, uh, because the uh, N64 DD has an expansion game called uh, F-Zero Expansion, and it requires a Japanese copy of the game to run the whole thing. And so the problem with that is that the back of a Japanese game is different. It will not fit into an American console. So the easiest way around this is to find a donor cartridge of your region and swap the back out. So guess what I did? I swapped it out with the back of F-Zero. So really, it was just a donor cartridge. Sports games, man, they make amazing donor cartridges. And for the N64DD, since we're on the subject, I picked up Doshin the Giant. 
You would never know by looking at that cover art, would you? That is the actual cover of the game. This is not like the manual's ripped out and this is like the first page or something. This is the cover. You would never know what the hell this was. The spine sure as hell doesn't help me, because obviously I don't speak Japanese. The back is not particularly helpful either. I mean, look, it's a series of photos and shit. But I'm telling you, this game is Doshin the Giant. Look at it. It's it's about this guy, uh, this godlike. It's like a god simulator type of game, and that's an N64 DD cartridge. In case you've never seen one, um, yeah, it's it's about this godlike. It's kind of like black and white a little bit, except instead of having hands, you pull, walk around as this godlike character. But yeah, is, this is the probably. I mean, if the N64 DD had ever been successful, this would probably go down in the pantheon of like worst cover art ever because. You would never know what this game was just by looking at it. What the hell is this? No. And it's got pictures of kittens. How is that a god simulator? I, did, I don't know. It would probably help if I spoke Japanese, I guess, but damn. All right. Anyway, I also picked up... Now, this is an unusually stupid pickup, or what it looks like. Uh, this is a max memory card, 16 megabyte memory card for the PS2. I don't typically do accessories, save for certain exceptions, but um, in this case I will, but I'm not going to talk about it in this video. This is actually getting its own dedicated video, so stay tuned for that. And finally, also for the PlayStation 2, I picked up a game called Siren. Now, this is a pretty sweet horror game for the PS2. And I have enjoyed it so far. I like a lot of these. That, I, I gotta give the PS2 credit. Uh, it has a lot of really fucking cool horror games on it. Um, uh, Rule of Rose. God, I'd love to get my hands on Rule of Rose. And, you know, a bunch of others like that. And Haunting Ground, I think, is another one of them. I also need to get my hands on. But, um, yeah, Siren. There, I didn't even know this until recently. After I bought this, I did a little research. And found out there's actually two sequels to this that were never released in North America. They were only released in Japan and, thankfully, also in Europe. And I think... I can't remember the name off the top of my head. I want to say Project Siren or something like that. No, it's not Project Siren. I don't remember the name. There's a sequel to this game, Something Siren 2, and uh, there's a third one called, like, Something Blood Siren. I guess... And that's for the PS3, actually. And so I'm asking European viewers out there. If you have those two sequels that you don't want or willing to trade, willing to sell, whatever, send me a message because I would really like to pick those up. So, I mean, I could always resort to eBay, but if there's anybody out there who has them and doesn't want them anymore, please let me know because I would love to get those for my collection and to play them. Uh, so, really, that's it. That's my pickups. Uh, I want to say, well, of course, of course, thank you guys for watching. Uh, thank you again to Chad, to, my, to uh, Daniel, and to This I This for hooking me up with this stuff. And uh, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys later.